Sorry, it's loading. <laughs> oh, my thing says we're now streaming live. So we're good to go? Uh, we're good to go. Okay. So I'm gonna call our Community Development Advisory Committee meeting to order. It's Monday, June 21st. It is 6.36 maybe. Uh, can I have a roll call please? Uh, Citizen Member Peter Annis. Citizen Member Dennis Turpin. Here. Citizen Member Guy Bain. Citizen Member Neil Caldwell. Here. And Citizen Member Seth Molina. Here. And Chair, Vice Chair Tom Burnett. Here. And Chair Lynn Grinstead. I'm here. Perfect. Um, I would like to, to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we work and gather is the traditional unceded territory of the Anishinaabe people. This Algonquin nation have lived on this land for thousands of years, long before the arrival of the European settlers, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to be present in this territory. Thank you. And today is in um, Indigenous Day, so I'm quite happy that I got to read that tonight. Uh, adoption of the agenda, please. Be resolved that the agenda for the Community Development Advisory Committee meeting dated Monday, June 21st, 2021 be adopted. I need a mover and a seconder, please. We have Dennis and Seth. Does anybody have any questions or concerns about our agenda tonight? So all in favor then. That is passed, thank you. Uh, any disclosures of, disclosures of pecuniary interest? Oh, I'm stumbling. I see none. So adoption of the minutes of our previous meeting, please. That the Community Development Advisory Committee minutes of April 19th, 2021 be adopted. I need a mover and a seconder, please. Uh, Seth and Neil, does anybody have any concerns or uh, thoughts on the meeting minutes? So all in favor then? That's carried, thank you. So we have a couple of presentations. I think Lindsay starts with our presentation on our new website. So I'm just, oh, Kayla, or Maureen, would you be able to allow me to share my screen? Oh, sure. I should have done that. <laughs> well, how do I do that? <laughs> I have to change the host duties, right? Uh, nope, that's not working. Here, I, I can do this. Okay. There we go. Perfect. There you go. <laughs> Way to go. <laughs> So we launched our brand new website this morning um, and I know I presented the concept plans to you guys back at our first meeting of this year, um, but I wanted to bring forward the site now that it's live and just highlight some of the, the key features of the site um, and showcase some of the improvements I, I feel we've made, in my opinion, to our original site. So when we designed our last website um, over six years ago at this point, um, it's a beautiful design. It was very graphically beautiful. It provided a ton of information, but it didn't do a very good job of pushing out information that we wanted to um, promote to residents and visitors. Um, and one of the, the major complaints we got about our website was the navigation of it um, and that it was difficult to find items that were on there. So when we, we came out to do our new site, um, those were some of the things we were really looking for. Um, was the ability to communicate better and um, ease of navigation. So I'm just gonna highlight some of the features of the new site. Um, if you haven't had a chance to, to check it out, I do encourage you to go tonight. You can go to armpower.ca. It is live and operating now. Um, and if you have any feedback or you come across anything while you're, while you're visiting the site, please let me know. I'm always looking on ways to improve it and update it. So right now, when you come to the website, you'll get this pop-up that arrives. And right now it just tells you that we have a new website. Um, the search feature takes about 24 hours for all the little bots to go explore the new website. Um, so we just wanna make people aware of that. It, normally these alerts would be used for emergency purposes or extremely urgent information that we're looking to get out. So no matter what, web, uh, what, no matter what page you come to the website on, 
this pop-up will come up um, and notify visitors of anything urgent that we want them to know about. Um, so this is the homepage of our new website. And uh, we've divided it into five categories now. Our old website was four categories and it just helps split out the information a little bit um, easier. Um, and it's designed to be sort of focused around living here. What, what kind of items would you need to know as a resident living in Armpire or moving to Armpire? We do have a moving to Armpire page um, that highlights some of those frequently asked questions we get from new residents. So this is where you'll find services that you as a resident would want to know sort of on a daily basis, as well as community organizations, healthcare, um, events, transportation. Um, the next section we have is rec and culture. So this basically covers everything there is to do and see in our empire. It covers all of our recreation programming, all of our facilities, the museum, Nixon Center, the library, um, archives, history and heritage, as well as all the things to do um, that are tied to, to our amazing community, like volunteering and the community groups and services that we have here in town. Because we do realize um, there's so much for everyone to do beyond just uh, the services that the town offers in terms of recreation and culture, as well as parks, beaches, and trails, which is a very popular page right now. Um, the next section is a new section. So it's building and planning. It's obviously focused on everything to do with building and planning whether you're looking at just building a deck in your backyard or if you're looking to do a whole new subdivision or build an apartment building in town. Um, and this covers everything, all the, the common questions and items that someone would need for that. Um, business and development, I'll touch on a little bit later because we do have a whole microsite for that. And um, town hall, which is all of the services that you would find if you were actually to come to town hall. So council, bylaws, um, applications and permits, our awards policies, our job postings, um, all of the sort of municipal services uh, versus living here, which is sort of the daily life services that most people would, would be looking for. The next section of the homepage is this big banner. Um, right now it's divided into the five uh, sections of the website just to help with navigation and, and have people get used to those, but this will be used to really highlight um, large scale events or projects that the town is doing and really trying to push out information on. So I can foresee in future years, we'd be advertising concerts in the park here in our market and um, like the waterfront master plan consultations. Some of those larger scale projects that um, we really wanna push information out or get, gather feedback and information on. Um, the next section are these four sort of tiles. Um, and these are based off of what we find most people are coming to the website for at this moment. All of these features are, are changeable for highlights. So we can change them up seasonally or we can change them up um, just if we notice we're getting a lot of questions about them. Obviously we hope to remove COVID-19 someday, but um, the rest of them are just things that we, we notice at the moment people are, are calling or looking for information on or like Camp Want to Go registration just opened. So we're trying to push that information out. Um, so these will change more frequently, at least seasonally, if not more. Um, the next section we're really excited about. So this is our news and notices section. It automatically pulls any of the latest news and notice items that we put out whether it's a new job posting, it's a planning notice, it's just an update on recreation, it's any proclamation that comes from council, any press release that we put out, those all automatically feed into this news and notices section. It will show the top five, like the five most recent ones. Um, and you also have the ability to subscribe to them, which I'll show later. And the right-hand side has our events being automatically pulled as well. So we have our community calendar, which is gonna automatically pull the upcoming, the closest upcoming event, as well as our council and committees meetings, which is gonna pull um, the upcoming meetings um, either in our council calendar or our council and committee calendar. The next section is our most popular services. So these are actually based off of analytics over the last six years from our last website. What are the pages that people are most, go, most visiting on our website? That's where these will pull, were pulled from they likely won't change as frequently as the rest of the homepage. Um, like I said, it, it will really depend 
on what's happening if there's a certain thing that's taking up um, like if there's a multi-year project that we're working on like the downtown revitalization I can see we would have probably moved that to the popular services because it's something people would have commonly been looking for for a longer frequency of time. Um, we have our social medias being pulled in as well as our YouTubes. So after tonight, our YouTube video will be featured right here because it will be the most recent one. Um, and then I mentioned too, we have the stay in touch at the bottom of all the pages. You can actually subscribe to our stay in touch and you have the choice to receive emails from a number of categories. So you can choose any of the news categories, all of them, any of the emergency alerts, any of the calendar. So anytime something's added to a calendar of interest to you, you can choose to sign up for um, notifications on those. On your garbage and recycling, if something happens to change about it, you would get an email notification at that time. Um, so that is the homepage. I'll just show you a couple examples of the interior pages. All of the sections have their own like mini, mini sort of home pages that have these tiles that help navigate to the, the parent pages further. And then any child pages that exist under their parent pages are all gonna show up on this legend along the right hand side. Um, and then we have the ability to create embedded forms in our website now, which we have definitely been taking advantage of. They're more accessible. Um, they're easier for people to fill out rather than having to save a PDF, fill it out, email it. It's just a simple fill it out, hit submit. You're, there's no risk of sending in a blank application form. Um, we've also used, utilized it in a variety of ways, like Megan has set up for the planning department, an inquiry and pre-consultation form. So that way she's ensuring she's getting all the information she needs in order to adequately answer um, a, a resident or a developer's questions or to adequately prepare for a meeting that she has with them. So that way it's saving time on both ends. She's showing up with all of the information she needs to provide her expertise and, 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 and guide the applicant um, for their project. So we've implemented that in a number of ways. Um, at this time, we're accepting payments for parking tickets and pet registrations. Um, and we're looking at the ability of adding uh, payments for some other um, commonly requested services in town also to the website. And then we have an economic development um, microsite. So I know I touched on this when I presented in February, but this is it live. So um, we wanted a separate economic development site that we could really utilize to sell the town to um, businesses we're looking to attract and also provide resources to current businesses that are here or residents or interested parties that are looking at starting a business here in our empire. Um, so we've provided a number of um, it's a, it's a similar layout. So you have the banner at the top, sections along the top as well um, with their drop downs. And then um, we have the ability to, once again, feature some commonly, um, a, some areas people are commonly looking for, some items that we want to push out. So hopefully we'll have some business events to push out and some more workshops and those types of things um, once we can start gathering again. Um, we do have. Our latest, um, we have our social media is being pulled in here as well. And then we do have a business news category. Um, so this, this latest news section is simply going to be pulling only business related news. So this will be a way for us to communicate with our current business is like letting them know that there's now free rapid tests that they can get through the Chamber of Commerce. Um, we get notified lot of organizations of programs and grants and services and they asked us to share it with our business community so this is just another way that we're able to do that um, we have an available uh, property and lands section now so we had this on our current website it was highly utilized but it wasn't searchable which made um, it quite difficult especially since most of the time people are looking for square footage um, when they're looking at an actual building or acreage. So the ability to be able to sort by those categories um, is really handy as well. We have the add the property feature. So anyone who has a commercial or industrial space for rent or land in town 
can create a profile and list um, their property on the town site. And that way they can log in and update it as needed. Um, they have the ability to add pictures. And this is a really nice display. Um, it's very similar to what you would see on a real estate listing. I have the ability to print the listing to a PDF. So that way when I'm putting together economic development packages to send out um, to potential to inquirers, I can quickly create PDFs that showcase all of the available properties that meet their, their search criteria. Um, and then I just wanna show the business directory as well. Um, so the business directory was our, our last business directory <laughs> left quite a bit to be desired. So I'm really excited for this new business directory um, to, to be able to showcase all the amazing businesses and services that we have in town. Um, so once again, it is searchable as well. We have lots of categories. Businesses have the ability to um, be featured under multiple categories because we have a lot of businesses that offer multiple products and multiple services that fall under a number of categories. And we couldn't do that on the last website. Um, and I'll just face what those business directory look, listings actually look like. So um, once again, the businesses uh, register, create a login. So that way they can log in and update their business um, directory listing whenever they like, if they change their hours, if they have COVID protocols that they need to put in there, if they introduce a new service or new product line, they can go and edit it. They could edit it seasonally because they have the ability to have pictures. So they can have their logo, um, their location, list their website as well, list products and services, have photos. Um, they have a map as well, contact information, whatever information they wanna list publicly. Um, all in this sort of nice little website. And then they even have a URL that takes people directly to their business listing. So that way, if maybe they don't have a website for their own business, this can kind of act like their mini website as well as being promoted on the town's website. So that, actually I'm gonna, uh, no, sorry. I was gonna leave the, that, the screen share up, but um, are there any questions or comments on the website at this time? Any, quest any questions for Lindsay? Perfect. Well, you explained it really well then. I encourage you to look at it. And um, the business directory, I forgot to mention, is also open to organizations and um, service clubs and charitable organizations, schools, churches. So I encourage you to, to really promote. We want to get people entering their businesses in there so that way um, we can fill that directory up. So you could help spread that word, I would appreciate it. Thank you, Lindsay. Okay, up next we have um, Janet on our federal historic site designation. Very cool. I need to ask if you can hear me. We yes. can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. I can't hear you, but as long as you can hear me, that's good. You can't hear me at all? I can I can I can't hear you through the headphones. I can hear you from the computer, but um, okay. <laughs> past, we've had problems with you hearing me. Okay, no, we're good. Okay. Sorry, and I'm just going to go to my share screen here. Yeah. If I can. Uh, it. I have the PowerPoint right there and share screen oh I don't want to share the screen with you <laughs> uh, can you see that yep yep slideshow There we go. Okay. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> this PowerPoint is uh, about uh, requesting designation for the DA Gillies building, which, of course, you all will be aware houses the Armed Power and District Museum. Formerly a Thomas Fuller Post Office. It remains a Thomas Fuller Post Office, and that's why it's an important place. This is what it looked like in 1906. You can see it's 
a slightly different configuration of what it is now. Um, to the right of the uh, window on the on the uh, John Street side, you'll see that there are steps going into the building. They uh, appear to have been reinstated more than uh, three times in its in its lifetime. Um, but now, as you know, it's a window and it will probably remain that way forever and day. But you can see it's quite an imposing building. Built in 18, between 1896 and 1898, um, it was designed by the Dominion architect Thomas Fuller. Of course, he also designed the first set of parliament buildings in Ottawa, and um, he was considered uh, a Dominion builder as such. So he was building Canada. Uh, through post offices and buildings like the uh, D.A. Gillies building. This is a nationally significant historic site due to its architecture and the influence of Canadian Postal Service in the formative years of rural Canada. So if you think of moving to Canada in uh, 1900 and you've come from Ireland or Scotland or Germany or from that, wherever you've come from, the first place you're going to be going to is the post office to send letters home to tell people that you're fine and that you've arrived. Um, no telephones, of course, no radios, no other way of communication except through the post office. So these buildings were doubly important, not only to create a postal service, but to create a big community as well of all the people who had um, moved, to, moved to Canada. So the Dominion image that Fuller was creating was one of very great stability and also of strength. What is historic designation? Well, to be considered as a formally recognized national historic site, a place, a person, or an event will have had a nationally significant impact on Canadian history, or will illustrate a nationally important aspect of Canadian history. In the case of the D.A. Gillies building, it's a Thomas Fuller designed Dominion Post Office and Customs House. I underline Customs House because we very rarely include that in the description of the building, but it, it was a Customs House. What is historic designation? Well, since 1919, the Historic Sites and Monuments Board of Canada, the HSMBC, has advised the Minister responsible for Parks Canada on the designation of nationally significant places, persons, and events, and on the marking of these subjects to enhance awareness, appreciation, and understanding of Canada's history. How do we designate? Well, first of all, a nomination has to be made by the Town of Our Empire. Once a nomination is made, then a municipal resolution supporting an application must accompany the application, which is a pretty straightforward bit of paper in actual fact. So um, it's a very simple ap application, but it all starts with being nominated by, by the town of Orangeburg, by the town council. Uh, in the application, there are clear and precise descriptions of boundaries of the property. So if you uh, know where the stone wall is between the museum and the um, in the library, that's one boundary, and the other boundary is a really narrow boundary just at the back of the building, um, and also John's, John Street and Mad Madawasa Street on the other side. Um, we do have drawings of these. Uh, fortunately, Public Works was able to dig them up for us, which was great. And um, uh, in addition, the, all of the, uh, the identification of all the major built under natural components of the property will be listed. So that also includes a few uh, unusual features that the building has, which I'll get to in a minute. It also wants to know what the site condition is, whether it's in good condition, whether it's a ruin or whatever. But generally speaking, the D.A. Gillies building has been very well maintained. It certainly has had a few issues in its time, but for a building of that age, it's in pretty good shape. And uh, it also requires photo photographs and plans showing the elevation of the property, which we also have. How does, the de 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 how does the designation process work? Well, if the nomination complies with the Historic Sites and Monuments Board of Canada's criteria and guidelines, the subject is brought forward to the board in the fall or spring meeting. They only meet twice a year. It can take up to two years for designations to be determined. Why would we designate the D.A. Gillies Building? Well, there are a couple of really good reasons. The D.A. Gillies Building is considered the keystone of our empire's heritage district. It attracts a lot of people already without being a designated build building. It has significant architecture 
and it's in great condition. The fine example of architecture dwindling numbers throughout Canada. So although about 78 of these buildings were first built, we're down to less than 20 throughout the country. Oh my so it's important that this be cared for in perpetuity. De designation ensures that, and it ensures the future of the building. <clears throat> Advantages of designation? Well, perhaps the most significant one is that money is available for renovations to structures through national cost sharing programs for heritage places, up to 50%. So the advantage of this is that um, if there was a big capital project that needed to be done, um, funds from a provincial uh, grant could, could be uh, shared with this. So 50% from the federal gov government, 50% from the provincials, and you'd end up with a very large project indeed. And there is no limit as to what they will um, cover. So um, uh, I... Uh, my pet project, as most of you know, is to make the place an accessible place for every, everyone of all abilities. And that includes an elevator. So um, with this designation, it would allow that to be built uh, at no cost to the town. In addition, the advantages of designation show that Armfire is on the national stage of tourism, make, make it even more of a tourist destination than it is now. Combined with local commemorative, interpretive, and educational programs, designation can encourage pride of place, walking tours, doors open Ontario, festivals, and cultural tourism initiatives. It, comp it complements our existing heritage conservation district as well. Disadvantage of designation? Applications for renovations could take longer. So if let's say um, something was done to the build, building, um, it would have to be reviewed by a board. They wouldn't necessarily say no, it would just take longer because it has to go through that, that extra step. Cost of designation uh, is staff time. There is no application fee. The bronze plaque is provided at no cost and main, maintained in, per, in perpetuity by Parks Canada. This is an example of bronze commemorative plaque. At the Ros at the Ros Rosalind Willen Mill Company in Elmont. Do you have any questions? Does anybody have any questions for Janet? Maureen, can you unshare your screen so I can see yeah. everybody? Sure. Thank, thank you. You're welcome. Does anybody have any questions for Janet? No. No. This is very exciting, Janet. Yes, it is. It's, uh, we've been down a similar road on a couple of occasions, but I think this is, this is the key to Arm Fire being able to uh, afford to deal with the building in the way that it should be. And uh, it will, it, at, a, at, a, at a no cost um, um, end. You have a look at that, Janet. <laughs> Thank you, Janet. Thanks. Okay, moving on, we have no matters table deferred. Um, so we do have one staff report and that's Megan's going to talk to us about backyard hens. So that the Community Development Advisory Committee received report number 210621-01, considerations for the keeping of backyard hens, and that the committee provide feedback to staff on provisions to be included in a backyard hen licensing bylaw should council elect to implement such a bylaw. I need a mover and a seconder, please. Seth and Dennis. Okay, Megan, you're up. Excellent, thank you and good evening, everyone. Uh, so the intent of the report on the agenda this evening is to seek input from this committee should council uh, be interested in putting in place a licensing system for the keeping of backyard hens. So a notice of motion was carried by council in May that directed staff to investigate the possibility of a policies and a licensing system for backyard chickens. Uh, so as I said, the intent is to get feedback from this committee. The report itself provides an overview of the variety of reasons why people may choose to keep backyard chickens, as well as some uh, policies that staff and the town should be aware of if we're looking at promoting backyard chickens. 
Uh, OMAFRA provides a number of really great resources for municipalities to look at, which are highlighted in the report and have been reviewed by staff as well. So there are a number of sections included within the report that would uh, essentially go through what would be included in a bylaw or a licensing system, including a maximum, maximum number of hens that could be kept at one time, the fact that uh, only hens could be permitted, no roosters being permitted, that the chickens uh, could be kept for non-commercial uses only, so not the sale of eggs or the sale of meat from the raising of the hens. The report itself then goes into a little bit more detail about eligible properties. So determining in the recommendation from staff would most likely be that they be supported on single detached family dwellings to start off with. And then council could review a policy in the future and see if they wish to decrease the size of lots that were eligible or open up the eligibility to semi-detached units for incidents or townhouses, depending on how successful the, pro the program was. The uh, report also goes into more detail about the keeping of hen coops and hen runs, such as a high level where they can be placed in a property, making sure that there are appropriate setbacks from neighboring dwellings as well, as well as maximum sizes and the construction of the hen coops and runs. So for instance, they'd have to be constructed in a manner where predators couldn't get into the building, um, where food is not going to be uh, thrown outside of the hen coop area and so forth. The report also speaks to the fact that hens could not be kept at large. So hens would be required to be in their hen coop, not running around free range, I'm gonna say on the property or on other properties. And also the uh, staff recommendation would be that anyone who's interested in keeping hens would have to have a disposal plan in place or a veterinarian who could be on call should there be a concern with disease of their chickens or if a chicken were to pass away that they'd have a method of disposing of the chicken in a, in a safe and humane manner. The report also speaks a little bit to predators, so making sure that the, hoop, the coop is designed in a manner that predators would not be able to get in, as well as dealing with waste. So where was the the waste from the chicken and other materials within the coop, where would those uh, be contained on the property with staff recommending that the same setbacks that are used for the uh, hen run and the hen coop also be the setbacks used for the storage of those waste materials. And then finally, the report speaks to inspections. So with a licensing system, staff would have a, a list of properties that were permitted to have backyard chickens. And if need be, this would enable staff to be able to go out and complete an inspection. And that would most likely be done by bylaw enforcement who are recognized in the report as the enforcement mechanism. So there's still a, a Good amount of work to be done if this is something that council is interested in, but as I mentioned, looking to receive feedback and input from this committee, if there's anything that staff haven't considered uh, when it could come to the keeping of backyard hens. Any questions? Ennis. Just um, as far as the waste, I, they do have a section on waste containers. It's, is it obviously left up to the hen owners uh, to get, where would they dispose of this waste? That is an excellent question. I know uh, from some of the research that I've done, some people choose to use it in their gardens as like a composting material. Other people have composters on their site that deals with the waste. In larger municipalities, uh, they do accept waste in the green bin system, but the town of Brentford doesn't have a green bin system. But I think that'd be something that we'd also wanna discuss with the landfill to see if that's an option where we could have that segregated out as almost organic waste dependent upon as well how popular backyard chickens become. I think if there's just a few residents across the community, then maybe we don't need to go to that extent of contacting the landfill and working out a plan. But if it becomes much more popular, then that's something that staff will further explore. And just a second question, the same along the same lines, the containers themselves would, maybe this would be an opportunity for the town to generate some revenue by having the, to be able to sell containers to the hen owners. And the same time passes to the dump for organic waste. Just a, a thought. Yeah, that's a really great suggestion. Thank you. Okay, I'm probably, um, maybe this is a stupid question. What's the difference between their waste and cat or dog waste? Like they go straight into the garbage. 
I think it could. I think it's the volume of waste that sometimes more with backyard chickens and that's something not a case of backyard chickens. Big dogs and their waste. Like, I mean, it's a daily thing as well. So I'm just thinking like, uh, why is it, why does it need to be any different? So from the research I've done, I guess in many municipalities that have a green bin system, they encourage it to go into the green bin, uh, but that's not to say that it couldn't go into the garbage can. I just probably want to touch base with the landfill and the contractors to make sure that there were no concerns that we should be aware of there. I get the feeling that a lot of people who keep backyard hens also keep the materials and waste to use as compost. So I think the concern with the storage on the property itself would be that it's not um, causing odors that are impacting neighboring properties. So if you're keeping it on your property, some sort of container that would contain the smell, uh, but you're right, we could definitely explore with the landfill, just having it go in your, your typical household garbage. Right, okay. So kind of a crappy topic, isn't it? <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, it's my dad joke. <laughs> any other questions for Megan? Tom. Yes, Megan. Um, have you had any feedback from other municipalities that do have them as to the number? And are they receiving complaints? Because I can, I could see that, you know, uh, my neighbor has backyard chickens I don't. Then the neighbor on the next side of me has backyard chickens. And I know for a fact uh, that uh, they do cause rodents and that. So this could be an issue that uh, we would have to be concerned about it as well. For sure. So in the research that I did, it seemed to be quite standard to permit the keeping of between four and six hens on a property and many municipalities require that the hens be at least four months old before they could be on the property and that ensured that you were certain that they were a hen and not a rooster uh, but also it seemed to assist with some concerns where um, let's say a family has four chicks then the chicks are cute and fluffy and then the chicks grow into hens and they're less desirable to keep on the property so with the four month cut off it seemed to be that you knew what you were getting yourself into at that stage uh, in terms of complaints uh, there wasn't much that I found in the literature. It seemed like most municipalities started off on a smaller scale. Some municipalities did use uh, a, a pilot project, which I know council was not in support of, and I understand why. But we are seeing backyard chickens and hens pop up across Ontario. So even uh, Toronto, for instance, they're doing a pilot project that seems to have been quite successful. Many municipalities, so I previously lived in the city of Kingston and they allowed backyard chickens and also goats in some areas too. Some municipalities did require the owner who was going to have the hens to seek permission from their neighbors uh, as to whether or not they were in support of that, which I think becomes quite challenging, both from an enforcement standpoint and the fairness, because depending on the lot size, as long as it's an eligible property with appropriate setbacks, we can mitigate those concerns. And I don't think it's necessary to have permission from your neighbors. And also if your neighbors were to sell their property and change hands, I think that's a, a direction that council most likely won't want to go into. Um, but essentially by picking a lot size that's large enough and by having appropriate setbacks, that seems to be how most municipalities mitigate concerns uh, that you would be, a, a, that could occur if you had multiple properties in a neighborhood with backyard hens. I think uh, it's a fair question and, and I can't imagine, I, mean, I know I wouldn't be in favor of looking for permission from your neighbors because that's not fair. Your property is your property, but also you would think of, I just think of some of the property owners that have cats and dogs that don't obey the bylaws and rules. They don't have to ask permission from their neighbors to have loud dogs or cats that roam the neighborhood and do their business in, in flower beds and whatnot. So I don't think it would be very fair to insist on uh, a permission-based uh, model either. That's my opinion. Dennis. Would someone renting a home be eligible or is it the homeowner that has to apply? 
My recommendation would be that tenants would be eligible as long as they had the property owner authorized it. So in the application system that we would create, similar to a planning application that's submitted, you just need to seek authorization from the property owner. Perfect. Tom? Yeah, as you can tell, I'm, I'm hesitant on, uh, on some of this. And I, uh, I question that um, I have a, um, a joined house, so I don't have a very large backyard. I can't have four chickens. Would I be allowed to have two? I can, I can see that being an issue, you know, down the road. And that's definitely something that we can explore as staff. So if you did live in a townhouse or you lived in a semi-detached uh, dwelling, if there were, I guess, more restrictions uh, on the number of hens that you could keep. From some of the literature I read online, it seems that hens require companions. So many municipalities recommended that you not just have a single hen, but at least have two hens uh, so that they keep each other company. So um, I think that's something that we'd want to explore as well. My recommendation to council would be, and I fully understand not starting with a pilot project, but starting with larger lot sizes with perhaps just the single family detached homes with four hens would most likely be my recommendation at this stage. And then we can reevaluate the program a year in. And if there aren't any complaints coming from neighboring property owners and no conflicts that have arisen, then perhaps the, the size, the eligible property size is decreased and expanded to allow townhouse units and so forth depending on how successful the project is. And at that stage with smaller lot sizes, we could also explore having fewer hens. I uh, personally, the lot size is, is the key in, in my opinion. Um, but whether you have four hens or whether you have two hens, you still need a coop and you need a run, which is the same amount of space. So I don't think that the number is the issue. I think the lot size and, and this, the space required is, is the issue in my opinion. That's how I will vote anyways. It's not about whether someone has two or four, it's whether they have the adequate space that doesn't make it um, cumbersome for them or their neighbors. Neil. Um, what's the mechanism if let's say the coop smells really bad if you're a neighbor? Like, is there some kind of limit on smell or how is that actually gonna be enforced? Because I've been around chickens and they don't necessarily smell that good. Neither does pot though. And we've been we have to deal with that nowadays too. Sorry, yes. Megan, right. I had to say that before I let you answer. <laughs> Generally within the licensing system, there's a general criteria that does require that the, the coop to be maintained um, and that no odor is coming from it. So it would be a similar system to if your neighbor had a very odorous coop, you could call bylaw, bylaw enforcement would be able to come out and say, hey, you need to clean up your chicken coop. And with the licensing system as well, the value in that is to renew your license each year, you have to have been in good standing is typically how most licensing systems work. So there could be a case, and I recognize that council may not want to do this, or it might get quite political if you're taking away someone's backyard hens, but if you're not following the rules and maintaining them yep. in a safe condition, and then the license could be revoked. Absolutely. Any other questions? Awesome. Oh, Tom. One more, okay. uh, regarding regarding bylaw, um, are they are they aware and online with this? I understand, you know, that they'll be certainly getting more calls, more complaints, everything like that. So there's going to be additional costs uh, to the municipality for for more uh, bylaw enforcement along these lines. So I know that the clerk's department uh, who oversees bylaw is aware having been at the council meeting and have seen this report. I myself have not had any conversations with bylaw. I think next steps in terms of staff and going back to council would be going to council with a similar report like this to see if there was interest from council in moving forward with backyard chickens. And then if there was interest, we would have further conversations with bylaw enforcement and look at the creating the licensing system applications and so forth, and then would come back to council with all of that information. But that is something that we need to explore with bylaw is 
are they comfortable with enforcing backyard chicken provisions in a licensing system? And are there any other infrastructure that we need? For instance, if you had a hen at large, we're gonna to need to come up with a, a mechanism for that, for that hen. A big net. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, any other comments or questions? So I personally, the four hens max is, it, I'm comfortable with that, that's in the report. So I just wanna make sure everybody realizes that when we approve this, we're, we're saying that we back her, um, Megan's suggestion of maximum of four hens um, and the minimum uh, yard of uh, 500 square meters at this point and all the other recommendations that she made. So when we vote all in favor, this is what we're voting on. Everybody good? Can I just ask why you didn't want to do a pilot project? Um, I personally uh, um, was one that brought that up in the council meeting because for me, a pilot project, it, if we then decided as a council that it wasn't going well and you pulled it, I don't think it's fair to have families because kids get very attached to animals because some, some um, residents uh, that I spoke to, they're looking at this um, from many um many different aspects to be more self-sustainable, but also uh, for the food, but also as, as learning and, and chickens, hens become pets. Um, homeschoolers, I, the, a couple of the parents are homeschooling and it's, a, it's, a, it's part of their homeschooling regimen. So to start a pilot project and then six months later say, nope, pull the plug on it, all those children would then be told that they can't, you know, that those chickens are gone. The hens are gone. So I, I thought that that wasn't a very good way to do it. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Um, you're either all in or you're not because uh, I just think that to start something and and let young, you just think of your girls when they were young, to let them get attached to something and six months later say, nope, we're, we, we're not doing it. But I think you're right, uh, Megan. I'm all for if they don't follow the rules, they don't get a new uh, a new license and it's revoked and, and they lose their privilege. Any other remarks or questions? Okay, so all in favor of the way Lynn, uh, Megan's report is written? I need a show of hands if we're in favor, okay. So that's four out of the five of us, Megan. So CDAC, is in favor of this. Thank you. Thank you. We have no new business, I don't think. So I think we're ready to adjourn. That the meeting of the Community Development Advisory Committee be adjourned at 722. I need a mover and a seconder. Neil and Seth. All in favor? Thank you, everyone. It was Thank you. Thanks. Take Great care. evening. You. you too. Bye.